We begin tonight with more of your stories, profiling the men and women of World War II. As a baby boomer, I think I first became aware of the subject of tonight's story when I saw the film Patton, George C. Scott in the title role as the brilliant, unpredictable general, Carl Malden, his foil, the steady, conscientious Omar Bradley. They were as different as could be. Patton, the affluent military aristocrat, Omar Bradley, well, he grew up helping feed his family by shooting squirrels in rural Missouri. On June 6, 1944, D-Day, General Omar Bradley was on board one of the 5,000 Allied ships in the channel. He had helped plan this invasion, and his job would be to command all American ground forces as they pushed into France. During the war, Bradley was often just one of the generals in the background. He didn't get the kind of attention that Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower got. And more colorful figures like General George Patton or Britain's Field Marshal Montgomery made better stories. But Eisenhower once told war correspondent Ernie Pyle to go and discover Bradley, the man who would become known simply as the Soldier's General. On the morning of D-Day, Bradley made a point of putting on a pair of combat boots made at the Brown Shoe Factory in his hometown of Moberly, Missouri. He never left his boyhood behind. He loved Moberly, and I started hearing stories from military people. Carolee Hazlett about, spent five yeah, years heading up the effort to build up. this memorial in Moberly's uh, City Park, unveiled in 1996. Was, it started out as another civic project, but when she started asking for contributions, she began to realize that this was more than a hometown hero. It started pouring in. Uh, military leaders from all over started getting in touch with me when they found out that we were doing a Bradley Memorial because he was so well loved. Moberly is in Randolph County, about 30 miles north of Columbia, and Omar Bradley returned here periodically throughout his life. But he had grown up in rural Randolph County. His father was a country school teacher and part-time farmer. And Omar grew up poor but well-read, a good shot, and a good athlete. When his father died, he and his mother moved to Moberly, something of a railroad boomtown in 1908. They lived in this house on South 4th Street, where they took in boarders. Across the street lived Mary Quayle, a girl who would become his wife. But they didn't really date in high school. As the new kid in town, he never socially quite fit in. But he did win respect on the baseball diamond. The Moberly High School yearbook called him a good ball player, even if he doesn't look like one. His athletic skills would also serve him well at West Point. But he'd only applied because he heard it was free, and another area student had already been appointed. Both took the entrance exam at Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. The other student failed. Omar passed and he went to the academy. West Point, class of 1915. One of his classmates was Dwight Eisenhower. In fact, there were so many future generals, it was later called the class the stars fell on. A few years after graduation, America entered World War I, led by Black Jack Pershing, who had grown up just 50 miles from Bradley's hometown. But Omar Bradley wasn't here in France, he spent the war stationed in the U.S. Certain now that his military career would go nowhere without the battlefield experience his classmates were getting. There was little in those early years that foreshadowed the key role the young officer from Missouri would play in the next war. Well, yes, uh, it's a story told in an exhibit at the Randolph County all. Historical yeah. Society in Moberly. You got a favorite picture, or you got a favorite uh, ar uh, well, I like, artifact? Well, I like seeing uh, the ones with uh, some of the big uh, dogs, uh, you might right. say, of the Second World War. This is uh, Historical Society right. President Carl Rice has also heard plenty of stories about Bradley yeah. from veterans who have stopped in over the years. Uh, the little stories that you get, you know, he came by our regiment or whatever, ask us questions about if we're getting enough to eat and baths and stuff like that. So the ones that knew about him, they're, they're still um, remembering him as the GI's general. Mm -hmm. Montgomery. Montgomery and uh, Collins 
And they, uh, Wilbur the, Cruz uh, of Granite City got a closer look at the no, famous generals than most GIs in the, the European uh, War. He was a jeep uh, driver for an officer and Jewish often found himself on the edge yeah, of some yeah. big meetings, exchanging down, stories uh, with the other drivers. Nobody liked Montgomery. Nobody. Patton, I, I, I saw him in that, but then the stories, I think, I think he lives up to the stories we, because of uh, just the way he acted, you know, swagger that he had. And Bradley, maybe a little less flamboyant. Yes, he was a rather quiet man, I, I would say, and he circulated, as far as I know, he circulated in the group and got the job done, but there was no fanfare like with Patton. Norbert Bussman was a first lieutenant who served in North Africa and Italy. It took men like him as well as guys like Patton to win a war. <laughs> Patton was exciting, dynamic. Bradley was a steady as you go and uh, obviously a very brilliant general. Bradley didn't start the war as one of the top generals. He earned those promotions on the battlefields. He served under George Patton in North Africa and the taking of Sicily. But by D-Day, Patton was serving under Bradley, who now commanded the American ground troops in northern France. Generals Eisenhower and Bradley had been planning an all-out assault. General Patton, specialist in mechanized warfare, had his armored divisions ready. The weight of this offensive carried the American troops across the Breton Peninsula in four days. As in any battle, there were good decisions and bad decisions. And Bradley admitted he had not adequately planned for the obstacles his troops encountered in the French countryside. Did you ever fight your way through hedgerows? They're about six feet wide and five feet high. Centuries of packing have made them hard as cement. Then a sergeant came up with a great idea, a hedge cutter. When they told General Bradley about it, he drove 60 miles to have a look and slapped top secret on it. Bradley was criticized by Patton and by Montgomery as not being bold, aggressive enough in the battlefield. Bradley and others disagreed. He was proud of his tactical abilities, and especially of the fact that he was not reckless when it came to the lives of his men. Omar Bradley wrote that when he heard that Germany had surrendered and the war in Europe was over, he thanked God for the victory, but could not sleep. Haunted, he said, by all the men whose lives had been lost. After the war, Eisenhower and Bradley remained popular figures. Bradley first took over the Veterans Administration, and then, as Eisenhower considered his political future, President Truman named Bradley the Army's top general and the first chairman of the new Joint Chiefs of Staff. He served in the early days of the Cold War and the Korean War, retiring in 1953. But five-star generals never technically are out of the service. And in 1974, he was back in uniform, back at Normandy, for the 30th anniversary of D-Day. There were also some visits back home to Moberly, parades and speeches, and lunch at an old downtown diner. Omar Bradley died in 1981 at the age of 88. Fifteen years later, Carolee Hazlett found out just how alive the memories of him still were. I still get contributions. I have an old uh, fellow that served under him, lives in Independence. Every three months he sends me a big contribution to help maintain the memorial. Uh, I have never known any way that was so well loved. He was a soldier general. 